You're listening to Back to the Roots Podcast with Mike Klein. And along with Brian Wood today, we are sitting down with Daniel Wangard. Uh, He is one of the Wangard family who uh, started Pioneer Equipment. And uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, what they've seen in horse farming and agriculture, uh, along with how the business got started and everything, the innovations that have happened uh, over the last 30 years. So Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, and uh, it's been an interesting journey, and we're open to share what we've learned, and we've been blessed over the years in our business, and it's uh, it's interesting to look back over the years and see how things have changed, grown, and just the overall horse farming market. There definitely have, uh, like Mike said earlier, there's there's been some major change in in the industry and we as an organization have to adapt to that but to go back to how did it all start and i often have to re to reflect back on one of dad's mottos that we happen to be at the right place with the right product at the right time if we would have been 20 years earlier it wouldn't have worked and if we would have been 20 years later someone else would already have been doing what we're doing so it really was that and and i look back at for some reason god chose to give us this in a specific time period and has blessed our business to where it is today and and we are responsible as servants of the kingdom to to utilize the talents that he has given us and take care of this for a period of time and then hand it off to the next generation. So that's what my father has done, and that's what our goal is as well. So how long ago was that, that he uh, came in with the right product at the right time, and what was that product that first started? So my father was the oldest of 12 children, And when he turned 18, he was not needed on the family farm. Back then, most men had their own farm and their children working on the farm. So he got a job at a local machine shop. In that period of time, they needed some new plows on the home farm. So they decided to make some of the parts at the local machine shop where he was working and the rest of it they did at home in grandpa's farm shop he did local repairs sold baler twine to the local farmers and that's where they built the first plows they took them out behind the hill to test them they didn't really want anybody to see them (laughs) behind the hill (laughs) and then uh But after they did a couple of those, they had other farmers asking, would you build us some as well? And so it was either do it right or get out. So in 1978, my father bought two acres from my grandfather and built a shop and started doing this full time. And he got married in 79. He was doing this on his own. He didn't have any employees. And then it gradually grew, but it started out building plows, doing repairs. And then throughout the 80s, we added other product. And we continued at that location until 1995. At that point, we were up to about 12 employees. My parents also had 12 children, which I was the oldest. And we had two acres, a growing business, and... Uh, 12 children so we didn't have a lot of elbow room and that's where this place where we are currently came available it was a small farm of 57 acres about 30 acres wooded and for our family and the business it was the perfect setting and I remember as a 12 year old son my dad asking my brother and I to get together one evening and and what would you think about buying the the Charlie Snyder property and that used to be a property that every once in a great while we'd get the opportunity to go with one of our uncles to walk over this beautiful wooded place and it was kind of beyond our dreams that that could maybe be possible but it had ended up in a sheriff sale and my father ended up buying it there so that's where the process started here that was in 92 and then we we didn't have any buildings here so everything had to be built so we did the business first and moved into that in 95 and then it was 98 until the family actually moved here to the property was that that was a one bottom sulky plow or was it a walking plow that they built first 
the walking plow was the first one. Okay. The sulky plow came soon after, but it started out with the walk behind plow. And for years we offered that. Today, I think we still have a couple here, but that the the need for walking plows almost has completely gone by the wayside. Mm-hmm. Now, your plows are kind of kind of neat, and and there's other plow companies that are doing it now as well. But you use the Convernland European style bottom on the plow, which is the long moldboard. I believe you use number eight. Mm-hmm. Um, when did you start? Was that from the beginning already with that bottom? That uh, We started out with the old Oliver and John Deere bottoms. And going back to a little bit on the horse farming trends and as that has changed and talking about being at the right place at the right time, back after World War II, most of the horse-drawn farm equipment was put into the fence rows and the tractor farmers came along and the horse farming equipment was no longer needed. So it was available pennies on the dollars up until the 80s. And then after that, it started rusting out, especially here in the east, and people were having to go to the west to find it. So I remember in my younger days where semi-loads of equipment would be hauled in from the west into our local machinery sales, and because that was still in good shape and it brought good money. But at, and that those early 80 years was at the point where the price went up to the point where it made sense to start building the plows or other equipment as well. And so as time went on, there was more innovation came into play as far as how can we make this better. And so back to the Convernland plow bottom, how did we get involved with the Convernland plow bottom? <clears throat> the, our first introduction to that was a letter in the budget from a scribe in New York had written about this long plow bottom that they used to plow their soil. And he said he wishes Pioneer would adapt these plow bottoms <laughs> to their plows. He didn't have a brand or anything. It was just a long plains type plow bottom. And my father read that and he, he uh, cut it out and we talked about that, you know, is this something we should consider? And when I look back and I think about, you know, how we debated and, you know, is it really worth it? It's, it's one of those things where I have to look back and, and, and remind ourselves that we need to ask God to guide us every day as we go about our work because without that, we would have never decided that's the one. But we decided we need to at least look into it, so we did, and we bought a number of different brands. And we chose the Convernland brand because they were known worldwide for being the best plow bottom on the market. In, in competition, they always won. And they were also known for their heat treating process. Their parts last up to five times what the conventional parts were that we were using. And so that's a European bottom. It's made in Norway. The question came up, well, why didn't we have that here? And from what we've seen over the years, here in the U.S., farmers were allowed to use chemicals and fuel was cheap. So after World War II, as the tractor came along, that's the direction that that went. And the, the research stopped on plow bottoms mm-hmm. here in the U.S. The, the Oliver and John Deere's that we're using today still date back to that era. They plow exactly the same today as they did 50 years ago. Exactly. Where... In Europe, fuel was expensive and they couldn't use the chemicals, so they poured more research into plow bottoms and understood the value of doing a good job of plowing and how you benefit the whole season from that. Mm -hmm. Compared to going over it very roughly, we spray a chemical to it and we're done. Mm -hmm. Now, can you explain for somebody that, like myself, that didn't grow up on a farm, what a good plow uh, looks like, what the difference between the John Deere Oliver bottoms versus the Cavernland, what the benefit was, and then uh, you know what that looks like physically, and then also what the benefit is throughout the whole season. So the, the difference in, the, in the, the different bottoms varies in different soil conditions. 
And we have certain soil conditions, especially in this area where it's sandy and gravelly, that the Oliver and John Deere's do a fairly good job. But then you, what really changed the need for that was as people went to organics and also pastoring. When they were having pastors that had been in pasture for five to six years, they wanted to go plow that. That was a whole different story back to when they were doing a five-year crop rotation where for a five-year where they were do, plowing that hay every year or two. Mm-hmm. So that was a, a need that had not arisen in most areas that is really different today from what it was back then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And on the plow bottom, like the convertland, the, the mole board, so the part that goes out the back, has a is a lot longer and has a twist to it. So the, the sod, when you're plowing, goes through and is gently rolled over onto it. It pulls easier. And... The, like the Oliver and the International and all the other bottoms are short and steep and just kind of throw it over there. Where with horse farming, you don't, you can't control your speed. So with a tractor and in a, in a sandy soil, any plow will plow good because you can just add a little bit of speed and get it to plow nice. Where the convertible bottom will plow absolutely gorgeous in the right conditions, no matter on the speed. It, it's much more consistent and I, I always like to walk beside the plow, and it's amazing the difference. Your Oliver and John Deere, like Mike said, have much more of a throwing effect. So depending on how the root system is, it doesn't lend itself to be thrown. So instead of, of pulverizing and making a nice seed bed, you get chunks, and then you get holes, and your sod or whatever we, you call green manure that is in the field, it could be a cover crop, it could be hay, can have a lot of value for the emerging crop, but it needs to be completely covered to get a complete kill or you will deal with those weeds all summer long. Mm -hmm. Even if you harrow and disc, the roots are still down there, where if you get a complete cover and you completely kill them, then you will benefit all summer long. And that's where the convertible really shines. We've had people plowing rye grass you know as high as their head and be able to roll that underneath that furrow because of the longer mole board there's a slower more gentle twist to it and it has much more room to take that cover crop and completely mm-hmm. put it underneath mm-hmm. and you don't have the green mohawk in between the bottoms that you do with the others if you're plowing down a tall green manure but going back to what you said about chemicals and not not worrying about plowing i mean there's still this mindset in the united states it doesn't matter how i plow because i've got a 30 foot disc that i can just beat it to death and get it to look fine but what you're not doing is just what you said where you're not plowing down that seed bed you're not destroying those seeds so especially in organics you have to weed control starts when you start plowing not once the crops in because a cultivator is the last resort in weed control and the other big thing that i think often gets missed then is if we don't start right we're paying for that all summer long and we expend a lot of energy that we waste in the process of trying to take care of that problem that we didn't take care of in the first place So the Converland plow bottom, from our research and testing, plows up to 10% easier. And if you look at the point, there's concaves on that. They designed it to try to take the minimum effort to pull that plow through the soil. And in... There's a, there's a lot of stories of this plow pulls easier than that plow and so forth. And the research we've done is there's very little difference if you take the exact same width, the exact depth in the same field with the same horses on the same day. There's very little difference. But we saw up to a 10% gain with the Cavernland. But in other brands, it's it takes so much to cut it off and turn that soil. So if you have a good point on it, and you do that right, and you plow the same width, a lot of times where people get confused is they're not plowing the same width or the same depth, because that will obviously change that on how hard it pulls. But back to the point, if you're plowing and doing a right, the, the, the right job the first time through, it will take a lot less 
harrowing or disking or, or uh, tillage after that to prepare that seed bed because you'll, whatever emerges is the seeds that are on top of the soil. It's not what you plowed under. So that's the benefit. And one of the, another one of those is if you look at a plowed field plowed with a Cumberland bottom versus an Oliver or a John Deere, especially a hay field or a tough sod field, you can see it from a half mile off if, if it's plowed with a Cumberland or if it's not. And the horses will like it a lot better because there's no whole groundhog holes where they can step into. It's nice, flat, it's level. And then you can go over that and work that and be prepared for your seed bed with less energy. I, I think the one thing we, we need to make clear on this podcast talking about mobile plowing is with horse-drawn equipment, with farming with horses, you know, the no-till and that type of farming is not an option. Some of them might have an eight-foot no-till drill. They do a little bit of seeding like that. But for the most part, for tillage, the number one option is still the moldboard plow. Uh, there's obviously some rotivators being used, but by and large, uh, the horse-drawn farmers still use the moldboard plow. And you're seeing the moldboard plow make a comeback in conventional agriculture as well. I think we're seeing more of that, and it's something where for certain weed control, they're having problems even to deal with the chemical end of it to get rid of it. So I think it it definitely has a very viable place on the farm. And the thing that we're seeing in our market that has changed over the years and that we see coming is how can we do more with less? Whether is it our land, is it our horses, the energy it takes? So even in cultivation beyond that, how can we take care of those weeds with the very minimal amount of energy compared to hitching four horses into a big heavy cultivator and just tearing that field apart. The goal is that we need to remember, and that's something for us as manufacturers, that we look at what is the goal. The goal is to have a weed-free field, right? So how can we, with minimal energy, and I go back to our, our business as a manufacturing business, we've had to look at over the years, how can we get better at what we're doing? Because our farmers don't want to pay for things that don't add value to them as a farmer. So I go back to the Cumberland plow bottom. When we first introduced that, that cost three times what the old Oliver and John Deere did. And our question was, well, our farmers going to pay for that. Mm-hmm. And, and we were the biggest obstacle to that. Once they saw the value, they didn't even need to know what the cost. They just wanted one of those because they saw the value. If you could save a trip across the field with the disc or with the column mulch or harrow, it was worth that. And the benefit throughout the summer that you didn't have those weeds when you were cultivating that you would have otherwise. So the value was there. So as we look at our whole manufacturing process, back in 2008, we took training in lean manufacturing. And that's all about looking at our whole process from taking that order to collecting the cash. How can we eliminate waste in that process? And we take the concept of we put our customer's eyes on and we walk through our plant and we watch people doing things. What are they doing that adds value to the customer? And if it doesn't add value, how can we just stop doing that? And that has completely transformed our way of manufacturing. And I see that happening on farms as well. Because as we get into our new age of farming, we have to change and adapt And part of that is making sure we're not doing things to our product that we want to sell that doesn't add value to the consumer that he doesn't want to pay for. Customers are obviously willing to pay more for things like organic products because they know it has value and they're willing to pay for it. So it's all about how can we eliminate the waste in the process. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's ever fitted ground with a team of horses it's a very slow process so if you can eliminate one time across that field with horses pick a 10 acre field i mean that's a day 
that you just eliminated. So if if you can do that on on a farm, that product is going to sell itself just in the cost savings to the farmer. Now, we've talked a lot about the plow, but that was the beginning. Mm-hmm. That's what got Pioneer Equipment on the map. Mm-hmm. Uh, where where did you branch out to, you know, where did you, I kind of want to hear, you went from the plow to where you are today. You know, what made you add all the different elements? So over the years, a lot of it was customer request for product. And in the 80s, we started with steel wheels, four carts and wagon gears, some tillage tools. And then as we migrated to our new facility, we continued to add product. And when I look back over the years, we are doing more products, more variety of products and less volume of one specific one. So, for example, four carts, back in the 80s when we started building four carts, that was a new thing for a horse farmer. They used to have all the the hay mower, the manure spreader, everything had a tongue in it. You didn't pull things with a four cart. Mm -hmm. Whereas that changed, there was more and more need for four carts, and all at once everybody needed one, two, or three on their farm. So I remember the day when we build a hundred of those every month and we never had enough. <laughs> but today there's probably 30 to 50 manufacturers that manufacture some sort of a four cart. So we had to become better and have a four cart that offers more value to, to the to the farmer. That's Some pretty more basic bells and tool. whistles. <laughs> and we also had to be careful that we don't add things that really didn't have value to the farmer. So it's all about identifying what makes it easy. And one of the things that on a on a, the basic four cart was we used to have the tongue to where it bolted underneath the frame. If you wanted to change it to a shaft, you had to get underneath and loosen the bolts and, and install a shaft. Today, that shaft and tongue are up in front of the forecart where you can stand, you pull a pin, you pull the tongue out, you put a shaft in, put the pin in, and you're ready to go with a shaft, single horse instead of two. So there's just things like that. Torsion axles is another big thing that we've added over the years that just add a lot of value especially to the farmer that's older he's got some back issues and he's tired of bumping through that field 10 hour you know five to six hours a day in the hay field raking hay it adds some comfort so there's things like that that have come along over the years that have added value to the customer and and we talk about competition from our strongest competition are also our best friends and we share information and we work together. So I see a lot of value and in, in, in the competition. And one of the, the places that has really helped horse-drawn equipment innovation is horse progress days. That is where all this equipment comes together and people can see all the different brands in action and the manufacturers come together as well and they they see an idea here how can i adapt it over here and it has taken the whole horse-drawn equipment industry to a whole new level of innovation Mm -hmm. it's a lot like the farm science review uh, for big agriculture the horse progress days is that version for Mm horse-drawn so um you know as far as creating or finding these uh, additional values or creating these new products. You know, you said um, it, it's primarily coming from customer um, requests, mm-hmm. but how does the actual process of creating a prototype and how much time is usually invested in, you know, making sure that this is something that you need to, that you can move forward with, that it makes sense in the manufacturing, that you have the equipment, all the different steps that, that it takes to actually put out a new product. That's a good question. And it's, it's not an easy answer, but uh, our salespeople are trained to whenever people are asking for something that we don't have to keep track of that. And then we have an R and D leader that leads the R research and development process. We have a chief engineer that is working with him on actually drawing the parts. So 
we keep that list and then every once in a while we go through that and identify what has the top opportunities and we learn things through the lean process of charts that we can use and put these into a hopper and then we have a rating system to determine what for opportunity this has and one of the things that we're always concerned about is that we look at a need that's not being fulfilled Rather than just copying somebody else's thing, we want to look at what, it, what will the customers need that they might not even realize yet. But it's going to be something that's needed in the future. And I'll take the, this past year, we introduced a new tine weeder. 20 years ago, there wouldn't have been a market for a tine weeder. Mm -hmm. But today, where organic farming is, it was a need that was up and coming that we saw coming and we had customers asking and talking about that made us look at that and, can, and consider that. So once we've identified it as an opportunity, then we will put a project scope together of who is the customer and exactly what does he want to do. So I'll take the tine weeder for example. The, the farmer's problem or issue is small weeds in his cornfield, for example. So he wants to remove those. So we always need to be careful that we don't have a preconceived idea of what this has to look like. And we need to identify what is the farmer's problem that he wants solved. Because any time that we can solve problems, we have a resonator that they're willing to pay us for because it solves a problem. And we have over the years done products where we thought they were a good idea, but later once we went to market, we realized that it was just our good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and it really, we, we have to go out there and identify with the customer what they're looking for and what is their problem, and then in a strategic way fix that problem. So we, we put that scope together of what we're trying to achieve. So there's things like, I'll take the tine weeder, what row spacings are we looking at? And at what times are we doing this? How big is the crop going to be to make sure that we have the right clearances? And how many horses can this take? So that was one example of the tine weeder. How can we do more with less energy? So now we're covering a 12 foot width in a cornfield with two horses compared to a cultivator that you can do four or five feet with, with four horses. So the, the, uh, we're always looking at how can we give him more for less? So now we have the project scope done. We know what it, the, the general outline. And then the engineer will take that and start drawing. Based on he'll draw the, the, the rows of the corn. He'll draw the, the weeds that are coming up. And then how he starts the whole process of where the wheels need to go, the frame. And then he builds this all in a CAD program. He can raise and lower the levers and make sure everything will clear because we need certain amount of clearance. All that will be done. And then once that's done, we build a prototype. So all the parts come together in the R&D department. They assemble the unit and they take it out into the field and they test it. And there's always some things that don't quite work like they had planned. So they bring it back, make some changes, take it out until they have a workable unit. And then once we have a workable unit, we build six to 10 prototypes that then go out to our dealers in various communities to test. So they will send them out to maybe 10 farmers in their area. And we usually do a survey that each farmer gets and then they fill that out on what they liked, what they didn't like, what worked, what didn't work, where they see more opportunity. And then that feedback determines the final version that actually goes to market. Mm -hmm. And it varies in products, but the, the timeline for that's anywhere from three to five years from when that first, when the idea is in the hopper until it actually is available on the market. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm guessing there's some, some smaller, less detailed equipment that'll go through R&D and hit the market a lot sooner than that. But like the time weeder, that is a lot of engineering and a lot of work that went into getting that right for the horse farmer. Correct. 
So, so there's, there's small changes that we make to current equipment as well as add accessories that might not take a lot of testing because of the nature of the product itself. So it's small things like that. We can make easier changes, put it onto the market, but we're always concerned to make sure that we look at what possibly could fail because every time we think we have covered all the bases and we introduce something and then we miss something somewhere and it's always easier and better to do it up front and and our customers have come to trust us that once we put something on the market they expect it to work so we have to live up to that and i can say that like as far as the tine weeder um, you know, it's it, we had an agronomy school in Indiana this year, and that tine weeder came to the agronomy school. And I can say that it went out for a week after the agronomy school. And there's a lot of excitement to have a new tool like that available for horse farming because I, I think over the last couple of years, we've seen some of the large scale tractor farmers that have, you know, improved found ways that and have tools available to them that have improved weed suppression on their organic farms and to have that same tool in a horse in horse farming is is awesome but you know as far as the whole you know creating a new product it, it's very similar to what you know it, it, we see this in the dairy side you know you're always trying to be first to the market with that product that you hope is going to be uh, what the consumer wants. And there's going to be flops here and there. I assume you probably had some flops along the way and learned as you went. Um, so, you know, I guess there's no real question there, but, it, you know, that's just what I'm hearing and what you're saying is that it's very similar. It's no different than a farmer, too, that's trying to stay up ahead of the market, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, going from conventional to organic or organic to 100% grass-fed, staying out ahead so that they're in a position where they can uh, continue to have a market that will pay for what they're trying to do. I think we are, as a business, in a market very similar to a lot of our horse farmers. We're in a niche market. If we, if we look at our market segment in the, in the horse farming market, we do some other steel manufacturing, but that's still our bread and butter is the horse-drawn farm equipment. So if we look a, at a walking plow, for example, there's no way we're going to sell a, a Dallas Texas housewife a walk behind <laughs> plow. So our market is pretty narrow. And if we look at our plain community, there's a less percentage of those people farmers today than there ever was. So that market's not growing fast. Mm -hmm. So and right now it's contracting because of the market. So we have to be creative. And we have to look out ahead what is coming and what will change and how can we become better. And in, in, if we have to do that to stay alive, I think it's the same thing for the farmer. If I look back to my grandfather's time when our business started, a lot of farmers were doing eggs, they were doing pigs, they were doing wheat, and they were doing dairy. They were diversified. And that's a concern that I have today. What I see on a lot of farms, the eggs went away, so we did pigs and dairy. The wheat went away, some did, still did some, but as the years went on by, the pigs went by the wayside, and we did more dairy, which worked good for a period of time. But I'm concerned that we're going to see that come back the way it was. Mm -hmm. that, and, and that's something that's hard to see go by, and, well, we, we'd like to do it how we've always done it. But we need to look at new and innovative ways of collaborating together and working together in how we market our product. Because if, if every one of us wants to be a lone ranger, those days are past. Mm -hmm. We need to work together. We need co-ops where people work together and pool their resources, learn from each other, and and pull their their products as well so that we can go to the market with a viable product because there are opportunities in the market today but we need to we need to be able to be open to change 
or we won't be able to get mm-hmm. on that boat. Mm-hmm. I think we're we're especially seeing that in dairy right now. Um, you have got to be willing to change your operation and do a lot more documenting and a lot more paperwork and different sort of, you know, certifications and stuff, because that's what the marketplace is demanding. And if you don't want to do that, you're going to be left in the dust. So with the farmer having to change to find, to find a place in the marketplace to, or, you know, to, so he can stay viable, you have to be looking at, okay, what's the farmer doing different to stay in that market? Now, what can we do to help him fill that need? Exactly. So you're, so you have to be looking three, four, five years down the road in your innovations because if it takes you three to five years to get a new product on the market, well, you know, things really can change in three to five years. So you really have to do your homework looking forward. It's more important than it ever has been to stay on top of that with the market we're in because there's so much change happening. And I come back to that doing more with less. So we're trying to produce more on less acres. It is it vegetable production, is it grain production, whatever it is, grazing. In all those markets, we need to do more. So we're always, I mean, soil fertility and all that is a big thing. But one of the big things that we see coming is, is weed control. That's something that everybody struggles with. And a lot of energy and time is spent in dealing with weeds. So how can we, there's an educational process in understanding how to most efficiently deal with weeds. And I come back to the tine weeder there from how can we deal with that weed before we see it compared to once it's two inches tall and we mechanically remove it. So, There's a lot of opportunity, and there again, we can learn a lot from the European technology. They've been ahead of us here in the U.S. in in developing precision cultivation to where we use minimal energy to get rid of that weed. And it's all about understanding how that weed functions and how can we destroy it at the right time with the minimal amount of energy to keep that weed free field. Mm -hmm. And Mike and I were talking on the way here. Mike's nephew was just down in Texas or, you know, the, that part of the country on a um, harvest crew. And he was talking about how in the panhandle of Texas, they were getting, they were harvesting organic corn and it was 300 bushel. There was some that was 300 bushels to the acre, which is just phenomenal production. But then there was some that was also half that, 150 bushels to the acre. And Mike was saying that the biggest difference was weed control. So if you know, you're know you talking about more with less, that right there is a perfect example of doubling production simply based on good weed control and being able to do that efficiently in the right way that there's actually time to do it and, and you can get in at the right time and all that kind of stuff. That makes a huge difference to a farmer. Huge difference in profitability, too. And I think uh, we talked with Scott Myers yesterday, and he was saying how just because you're an organic farmer, it's still all about timing, and you should be able to cover the same acreages to be a weed controller or whatever that you organically as you can conventionally. Well, with a like you said, with a 120-foot boom on a sprayer, it's a little bit hard to compete with that with actually equipment. But when you're looking at timing is so key, whether it be weed control or forage quality or whatever it may be, if, if we can get a horse farmer needs a bigger window because of the lack of the, he doesn't have the abilities to cover as many acres. But with the tine weeder is a prime example where you're cutting down on the energy, but you're covering a lot more ground in less time. So if, if we can, as the, the markets become tighter, Farmers are going to have to have more tools in the toolbox. And that's why I think when the time weeder came out, I, I haven't been that excited about a horse-drawn implement in a long time, simply because I saw how well it worked with tractors, and it's really nice to see it being used with horses as well. And, and I think as, as we looked at the time weeder, one of our goals was that a young boy can operate this. 
And so now instead of having to watch his rows very closely, as long as he drives the horses in between the corn rows, the rest of it is going to stay off the corn row as well. And two horses can pull it. So instead of having four horses trampling over the corn, and especially if it's a little wet, you can get over that field with a lot less compaction than you could with a cultivator. So that, but we have to get it done at the right time because if we let those re roots set down, we cannot remove it at that point. So we have to understand the concept of the timing part to make sure we get that w weed before we see it or before it gets too tall or we can't phys physically remove it anymore. And then, you know, timing is, you know, the key but you know you have a year like this okay it was nice day so you cultivated corn and then it rained two inches that night and just rained all the roots right back into the soil and they started growing again so a farmer has to not only have perfect timing it, it helps to have perfect weather to go along with it and and there's never a year that's the same yeah so that's part of even i, I take the tine weeder i think the tine weeder can be a big asset but i don't think it's a it's a one-time solution for all problems because we have weather where you can't get into it. I've mm -hmm. had one farmer tell me he did his corn two times, had perfect conditions, and he probably wouldn't have had to do anything else with it. He had another field on his same farm that it rained at the wrong time and they just simply couldn't get into it and they, they tine weed it, they cultivate it, and they still had weeds. So it's there's a lot of variables in different fields, but the more we educate ourselves and understand how to maximize our efforts, and it's so easy if we, if we don't manage it, we come into the reactionary mode and we expend a lot of energy and time that is really not adding value to our crop. Now, you've... Uh, over the last year or so, you've expanded into non-agriculture sector as well. Uh, what Was that just the marketplace? Did opportunities open up or were you exploring this and found opportunities or did the opportunities come to you? So where we were at in the last number of years with the way the agricultural industry has been contracting, we have been able to maintain sales, but we haven't been able to grow a lot in our ag sales. So we were looking at other opportunities. And over the years back from the early days when dad started the business, we've always done some custom steel fabrication work. And interestingly, that has brought out opportunities in the rest of our business as well. For example, back in the, the mid 80s or late 80s, my father had taken had quoted a big job in steel fabrication to weld some parts that there was no way that they could weld those with a stick welder, which was the way they did things back then. And all at once he ended up landing it and he, and he didn't know how to deal with it. It was one of those things where you quoted and weren't sure if you hoped you'd get it or not, but he got it, so now he had to do it. So he went to his local supplier, and that was the, the time that we started using the electric wire feed welders. So it made our process a lot better, and because of that opportunity and that need there, it helped us apply that in our horse-drawn equipment manufacturing. And I've seen that a number of times over the years. The other big thing was the lean manufacturing. We spent a lot of time and energy in making changes, but our employees enjoyed their job so much more after we went through that and eliminated a lot of the wasteful activities, a lot of the, way, the tools they didn't need and they didn't use. Their areas were larger. They had more room to work in. And my dad looks back at that and says, that's the best investment we ever made. So some of those other opportunities in, in the contract uh, custom steel fabrication market have helped us improve our manufacturing process because of a need there. 
we do some some uh, steel furniture for the woodworking industry, and we do a, we have a laser and a press break, CNC laser and press break where we do we cut out a lot of parts and bend them and form them for other manufacturers. Anything from sm- the the smaller manufacturers that need parts to build something. So in a lot of different industries, and that is where we saw a lot of growth in this p- past two years because of our capabilities and also that market is strong right now. So I come back to the diversification on the farm. We see that in our business as well. If we're not diversified and the mar- one market contracts, we're out there holding the bag. Where if we have multiple our hands in multiple markets, if one is down, another one might be up or we can put some more effort into that. Another thing that has done very well for us is our buggy gear. We build a horse, uh, a an all steel buggy gear that goes out to the buggy shops, and then they install them on their buggies as they come out. So one of the market needs there was we have a lot of small family buggy shops in about all the plain communities, and one of their challenges was once they had they're good at building the top. That's what they do, and that's their specialty, and that's what people buy. But then they need a gear to put underneath it. Well, once they got done with their top, they still had to bring all the parts in to to assemble a wooden steel gear the old style way. They had a lot of parts that had to come together and paint them and assemble them, and then they could finally finalize the buggy. Where now what we offer is we have this gear that we will build per their specs with the wheels they want the brakes they want we will build that paint it and assemble it and ship it to their door within a couple days of when they need it so they finish the box they roll the gear underneath fasten it and it's out the door and they can continue on to the next one so that we have seen almost a 100 percent growth in that market in our last year and we're looking at more growth in that as well as we move forward so those are some opportunities that we see coming. Another product line that we just launched is Pioneer Industrial Workflow Solutions. So over the years, as we were making changes from the lean manufacturing, we would build our own workbenches and pegboard systems and just a lot of different things to make things easier and make things process faster. So periodically we'd have people asking us for would you build this for us or have you considered selling this well we never took it to that level until this past year so we developed a a number of brands within the brand so one is gridlock and that is after is patterned after the old a grid uh, after the old uh, pegboard system where you had a round hole you had a peg and then if you put too much weight on it it tore out this is a an all steel panel with a slot in it that also has a slot and hook tab type to where you can easily move that hook to change it and our goal was to develop a workstation that is right for the job we're doing today But if we need to change it and have different tools for the job we're doing tomorrow, that it can be adaptable to that. So that's where it all started. But we now have people using it in the retail industry. They're doing retail shelving with it because they can make all kinds of changes and put more product in a smaller area. And even in a lot of shows today, if people are buying a booth somewhere, they're looking how can they maximize their booth space so they don't have to buy as much space. So by being able to change their, their, their uh, we call it a flexture cart, which has a lot of different options. You can put shelves on it. You can put hooks on it. You can display a lot of different product in a smaller area. So we're just getting into that market. It's not, we, we, there is product available here and we're just retailing out of here, but we're looking at a distributor network and into the future on that as well. Mm-hmm. And that, that was simply expanding out into that is, like you said, you're diversifying. So it's a, it's a safety mechanism, so to speak, because uh, you're diversifying. But it's obviously the bread and butter was agriculture for you guys for years. And agriculture is tough right now. Um, a lot of farmers are struggling and they don't have the money 
to upgrade equipment like they had five years ago. So I'm guessing if the ag economy would come roaring back, that would still be your bread and butter. Uh, and we all know if farmers make money, farmers spend money. That's exactly right. We can't uh, we can't spree- uh, we can't squeeze blood out of a red beet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we have farmers have to make money in order to be able to buy new equipment, and that's why we're concerned in how can we help to look at new markets that are out there that we don't know about yet, because. If I look at our plain community, we have a lot of skill in farming, more than, than anybody else in the world has. The rich heritage we have. Now we go to the, the consumer market, and the consumer is more educated than they've ever been on what they're eating, and they are concerned that they are buying safe food from local people, And they want exactly what we have, Mm -hmm. what our farmers can produce. And they're willing to pay a premium for it. So we need co-ops like Organic Valley that can bring that together, that farmer and that consumer connection with the right products that these consumers are willing to pay a premium for. Because I come back to the niche market we are in as a manufacturer or as a farmer, we can't compete with the commodity. So let's not even go there. Mm -hmm. If that's where we're at, we're going to lose every time. We need to differentiate ourselves and we need to sell our value. Mm -hmm. Because if people understand the value, they're willing to pay for it more they'll pay double or three times if we give if we if we can help them understand the value Mm -hmm. that's exactly what we're seeing as well you know you're saying the words that we talk about quite frequently with farmers is that you know right now is a downturn but um and and hopefully we'll be able to you know the the farm will continue to be able to survive maybe not thrive for the time being but what is being done is the right thing so in the end that will shine through even though we've got some tough years in the middle here i think it's it's very important that we look at downtimes not as much as challenges and problems as opportunities and I go back to 2008 when we had the, when the economy crashed. And in our market, we didn't see it as soon as some markets did, but we still saw that. And I look back to that time. That was the time that we took the training in lean manufacturing. And we spent a lot of time in our business to change things and improve things. And by doing that, by, by eliminating a lot of the waste in the manufacturing process, one of the first questions that people ask, well, what are the people going to do that we don't need anymore? Because it doesn't take as much time to build the product. Well, we went from one guy's half of his time doing research and development to two guys full time during that process. So now we had more new products coming off than we had before. And I look back at some of the changes that happened because of that. Where would we be today if we wouldn't have done that at that point in time? Yes, we didn't have the profits that we might have had if we were selling a lot of equipment. But by investing time and energy into improving during the downtime prepares us because sometime things are going to change. Mm-hmm. And it will turn around and it might not be same, but there will be opportunity somewhere. And if we prepare ourselves, then we can take opportunity again to like my dad always says, make hay while the sun shines. Now, do you, when, when organics, organic dairy came into Ohio and in, I think it was 2002, uh, have you seen uh, the organic farmers? Have you seen a lot of sales going into organic agriculture? Did you could you see that change, or was it you know horse farming is horse farming, conventional or organic? The practices are very very similar. Uh, the conventional horse farmers are still going to mulberry plow. They're still going to a lot of them are still going to cultivate, but you know they'll be spraying. But did you see? like a significant uptick in the market when organics really started growing here? I would say yes and no. 
The as far as just a, a big increase in sales overall, not so much as, but more of a change. So I'll take the convertible and plow bottom for example. We went from not selling any of those to selling 50% of our plows with that bottom. So the organic farmer had the need and saw the value of the convertible and plow bottom where the conventional farmer might not have seen that value mm -hmm. so much. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So there, and, and there's other needs that arose like the tine weeder, for example, that the conventional farmer didn't really understand or need at that time where the organic farmer was really dealing with the issues and needed a problem solver for that issue. So, you know, one question I have is, you know, you we've talked a little bit up to present day and diversifying the business and what you've seen. What are you seeing from two perspectives for the business in three to five years? And then also for what are you seeing for agriculture in three to five years? So in, in uh, if we think about the market first, because we have to look at the market and react to the market. Because if the market changes, we better change as well, or we're not going to be, be viable. So what we see in the, in the future of the market at this point in time is it probably will get better than what it is now, but it probably won't go back to where it was two years ago. So... We need, as, as an industry, the farming industry, we have to become more creative and do more collaboration. The days of being a lone ranger are past. We need to become part of something to be able to pool our resources and learn from each other and then pull our products, whatever we're producing, and be open to change. If we're open to change, there's markets out there. People eat produce today that I don't even know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and we need to be able to, if our consumers are asking for whatever it is, that we need to be able to be open-minded enough that we learn how to raise that in whatever way they need it. And if we do that, we will have a job. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, we're going to go to the wayside. Yeah. And somebody else will fill that. Because what if there's a need out there, somebody will supply it. And if you have the opportunity, it can be you to fill that need. And if I, if from what I, I don't consider myself a market expert in what the market needs are, but from the little that I hear, how much a lot of our local cities consume even if we would all work in the produce market, we could still only do a small fraction of what they need on a daily basis. So the opportunity is here if we can connect. Mm -hmm. But we need to collaborate. We need to work together. Food safety is a big thing that will only continue to get more complicated. We need to adapt. And we deal with that in our business from the legal things like OSHA, EPA, and all those regulations. It is complicated. It's expensive. But the days of not complying and working with that are over. We, we need to, it's our Christian duty to abide by the laws. And a lot of times it's not as complicated as it looks from the outside in. Once we start doing it, we get through that first process and we get into the routine. It's just another year and we update it we make sure that everything's done and we're, we're it, off it to becomes start. normal operating procedure correct and once you're through that initial sticker shock of you know what how terrible this is going to be it's just a part of what it has to be done and, and we have even from the humane side of handling our animals we have to be willing to do things differently because of what our consumer wants to see. Mm -hmm. And if we're open to that change, people want, I'm, I, th I just think of dairy, people want to know that you know all your cows and you know which is Patsy and which is Linda and which is Katie. And, and they, they, want to, they want to know that and how you understand it and how you take care of them. Mm -hmm. And if we're open to share that, they're willing to pay to, so that they can know that. Mm -hmm. I think I think one of the things with with animal care, uh, which is a huge push 
in dairy right now. And it's not that farmers that we work with aren't taking care of the animals at all. It's That's not the case. The, the case is it's not documented. So now that needs to be documented. Uh, it's not that they have to change how they take care of their animals at all. Uh, I mean, there's, of course, people here and there that need to take better care of certain animals. But now it's just a matter of, can you show me a paper on what your standard operating procedure is? And once you have that, it's a living document that you just up, upgrade whenever you change a practice. We communicate mm-hmm. how we do things. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. And I'm sure you see it in your business, too, that some of these regulations, like Mike said, when you get over the sticker shock and going back to the... Um, the animal care side of things and the documentation, yeah, it, it it can be a pain for the farmer that has to change some of the way he's practicing, but there's also a market opportunity there. And that's where, that's part of what's driving this. If we can say, look at the way we take care of our animals, it's all right here. We do this verification. There's people that will buy, like you said, that will pay double for a product because they know that it's taken care of in the way that they they want that that they expect Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so from our perspective then how what do we see in our market in the next three to five years we have i i didn't mention it when we were talking about other markets but in the last couple years we have brought on some tractor farm equipment and added it to our line so that it could be pulled by horses so one of the first was the Machio tiller. So we had a lot of farmers that were wanting to till, and they were trying to adapt that to horses, which brought some challenges. So we de- developed a relationship with Machio, which is manufactured in Italy, and are a master distributor for Machio. So we bring in the tiller and add things to it to make it usable behind horses. And so that is our goal. In a lot of cases, if the plain farmers are going to their tractor dealerships and trying to work with what their tractor farmers are using, it's big, it's too heavy, it's, it doesn't have the adaptions that they need to do it efficiently and well behind horses. So one of our newest things there has been a round baler. That is also manufactured by Machio. In that case, we're actually branding it with our name on it. And originally we had thought we wouldn't do that, but because of our dealers were asking us to put our name on it so that if the farmer is using a baler and somebody sees that, if they see our name, they immediately think of our local dealer and they know where to go to get one or get parts or whatever it is. So to help our customer, we decided to brand that with our name. Right now, we're basically bringing it in, and they they manufacture them to our color and to our spec. And we were looking for a baler that was small, rugged, and dependable, but it didn't have all the extra bells and whistles that our farmers didn't need and didn't want to pay for. And so that's the reason for bringing that baler on board. Rather than manufacturing one ourselves with the quantity that we're dealing with, we're looking at the market, what is out there that works and that our farmers need and how can we bring that into our distribution to serve our customers better. And one of the markets that we see continuing and growing is the hay market. Even if people are not no longer doing dairy or something like that, they still make hay. And so they will continue to need hay equipment. So we're looking at what else can we grow in that market. Right now we're looking at a a hay rake. We're looking at all the different brands and types to identify what is the best rake for our customer base and how can we put work with a manufacturer somewhere put brand one and put that to our lineup so we're looking at how can we add product to give more value to our customers and to our distributors and is you're expanding your line but you're not manufacturing it you're getting it done private label they're branding you're branding it they're building it but you can you can expand your line a lot quicker than doing all the r&d yourself to to manufacture it and, and something like the baler, that round baler is specifically designed for 
the sheep and goat and beef farmer, the weekend hobby farmer, which is the is the same um, is using his baler about the same amount as our horse farmers are. So it's it's the perfect unit designed for our farmer. In a lot of cases, if we're buying this tractor equipment, we're making changes to it to make it adapt to PTO carts to work behind horses. So there's as we bring in a product, start using just like the tiller, we have requests coming from farmers. Could we change this or change that so that it makes it easier for them to use and works better? One thing on the tiller was if the, once the tiller engaged, it pushed the horses. So we needed to have tiller sh or shanks that went down into the ground that would break that and hold it back that could be controlled. So things like that we're adding to that equipment to make it more, add more value to the end, con end consumer. Mm -hmm. How many employees do you have within Pioneer? Currently there are a total of 50 people employed and that includes myself and six of my brothers, which are all owners in the business. My father has passed the, the, the leadership management of the business to us sons. He is still a, a co-owner with us, and he's very involved in our long-term planning, financial decisions, and so forth. But the day-to-day -day operations, he turned over to my brothers and myself. And then we have a brother-in-law that's involved in the business as well. And uh, one sister, single sister, that is also an owner in the business. The rest of the employees are not family members, but all from about a 12-mile radius from here. Currently, we have three plants, two manufacturing, and one retail location. We just opened our, our first local retail store in Mount Hope this summer. And there again, our focus was on how can we better serve our customers and we had four local distributors, which did a good job for us over the years, but we saw that we need to bring it together to one location and, and look at growing it to offer more to our, our customers. Our customers were looking for things like financing, rental and leasing that we were not able to provide before where now with the new Ackermans location, we can offer that to our customers and add more services. The other big thing is service after the sale that we have parts and we can supply that in the field or bring parts in and repair them as well. So we see that as an opportunity even in other communities to help. We, we want to use this as a model, but we can take that model and put it in other communities as well in the future. And our two manufacturing plants, one is our main plant here where we do all the fabrication, welding, assembly, and painting and ship out of here. Our plant two, which is located about five miles from here at my brother John's place where he lives, we have uh, seven employees there. They have the laser, the CNC laser and press brake and do all the cutting for us here. It takes a big five by 10 sheet of plate cuts all the parts out, whatever is needed for a specific job. They form and bend it there and then ship it here and we take it from there. And how many dealers do you have across the country? Right now we're at around 250 and we have level A, B, C, and D dealers. So the more they sell, the more they stock takes them to different levels. So we have different tiers. And then if they're into the level A, they are listed on our uh, quarterly newsletter so that people know where they're at because we consider them a stocking dealer that we can direct customers to. We know they will have stock of product and that we can send customers there. In how many states do you have dealers? Good question. I sh should ask somebody in sales on that, but we have dealers in most Amish communities throughout the United okay. States and Canada. So if you have an Amish community somewhere, we'll probably have a dealer. And then we have a couple dealers that are strictly online dealers, and they at, we don't advertise on the web ourselves with our horse drawn farm equipment, but we have dealers that do, so they'll take orders we ship directly to the customer anywhere all over the world. And then we also have some, some non-Amish dealers, especially in the Western states, 
that sell to the horse farming communities in the non-Amish markets as well. Mm-hmm. So you wouldn't have a website, but some of your dealers would have websites where people could find, like all your equipment would be available online if they just looked mm-hmm. for Pioneer equipment. I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually bought one of your prototype bale carts. Somehow a guy, I found it on Craigslist, and it was, I think he said it was the first one you made, so I adapted it and used it to feed my round bales behind the gator. Is Works great. Right? So That has but been a good product for us. I, I saw, well, before you were ready to sit down with us, I was looking at the brochure, and I see how the bale cart has changed. Mm-hmm. It has been updated, you know, since, since I have the prototype. So. One of the big needs there was to, to have a round bale mover that you could unroll a bale of hay. So a lot of people have hay in stacks somewhere and then they need to feed one bale at a time and they want to roll it out for their beef cattle. And so one of the big things was how can we make an unroller that they can take it out into the field and roll it out. So mm-hmm. that has really helped sell that product. Yeah. But I just think it's so neat for somebody like me who has – a couple of acres and a couple of steers, once a few brown bales don't have a skid loader, that little cart behind the gator, I mean, you just back under it and crank it up and take it. It works really slick. I got some funny looks. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was very informative, very interesting. And uh, I do really want to thank Pioneer Equipment for the support that you have in our community here for the farmers uh, with the agronomy schools that we did, uh, your equipment that you brought, your sponsorships that you've done for organic farming here has been been really great. So we really appreciate it and appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us. You're welcome. And we say the same without people like yourself that share ideas, the farmers, and that's where I come back to that collaboration. If we all work together, we're all one big team. If we share these ideas, we can all become better. Mm -hmm. And the more of that that we do and work together, we all benefit. So I appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much.